Nonsense. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, so that should be recording. Uh, just want to say a few things about the news. And probably the most important thing is not anywhere here. Um, we had our faculty meetings yesterday. They canceled school, and they uh, decided to cut our department drastically. Um, with no explanation at all, and apparently no appeal, so they're going to cancel 25. They're going to fire 25 percent of the full-time equivalent faculty, which uh, people are currently fighting and screaming to find out what this means. But it means many classes will be gone next semester, and many faculty members. Um, and we don't really know exactly what that all means, but uh, there. I know. They haven't even, nobody knows anything. To try to decrease the cuts, they tried to encourage people to retire, and they won't know until Friday how many of them retire. And then after that, they'll have to figure out which part-timers are fired, which will be essentially all of them. And then they'll have to try to take the wreckage and try to rearrange what they've got to see what they can piece back together. Um, so <clears throat> uh, there will be big changes. None of us will have any clue what we're doing next semester for several weeks. Um, probably all previous plans of what's going on next semester are out the window, and, and obviously all plans for expansion of the department are gone. Um, we're losing our new faculty, and we'll probably end our participation in large cyber competitions and our partnerships with various companies and such. Um, we, there will be a lot of changes, and uh, it's, uh, I'll let you know when I find out anything more. But uh, very likely, almost all the full-timers will have to go teach beginning classes because there'll be nobody else to do it. So we'll see what happens. But this, um, this free city was too successful. So it attracted folks, but not... Yeah, attracted. it wasn't free city. Free city didn't help, of course, because free city was uh, just a loss for the college because it wasn't really free city. It was a San Francisco measure passed with strings attached that meant that we would never really get the money, which we never did. So it was just sort of a... They, we could only give students free tuition if we could prove that that each every student had applied for every other form of financial aid first. Yeah. And that's impossible. So we didn't do it. So we didn't get the money. So we haven't actually been getting paid for free city. Uh -huh. um, but free city is us drop in the bucket. Um, anyway, it's, um, I didn't know those yes. So when the college went to get the money, they were not given the money. I, don't know. I highly doubt it. I don't think anybody, nobody seems to have any power at all. Um, it's, it is a very strange thing. This cut was not even across the board, apparently. I think we, uh, what I understand, what I've been told is the higher upper management has no idea what we do or why we exist. They decided where it wants to cut. Anyway, um, this is, uh, this is the problem with the government sector. I mean, you're just uh, moved around by people that have no idea what they're doing. Uh, even more than in the private sector where it's different. Yeah. You know, anyway, I got a lot of things going on outside the college. There are other colleges that still value security. So um, I'll be uh, going to a lot of other places, teaching classes. Been that way for several years. So it's, um, if you work at a college, you expect a lot. It's like government, it's like the federal government. Things, be, things go out of fashion for no good reason. And uh, anyway, it may have, it'll affect you. You folks that want to take advanced security classes, there will probably be very slim pickings next semester. But I'll. Like a sans -like university. And people pay like literally 5,000 dollars per course. They do. And, and there is, of course, um, in higher education, there are a lot of people that feel like we shouldn't even be doing that stuff. We should only be teaching the basics and we should leave all that to the private schools. And that's maybe where we end up. We'll see. Anyway, um, so this one's pretty fun. They've been selling. Uh, location data, not only tower data, which gets you to nearest 100 feet, but GPS data, um, stolen data to people for years. And the phone companies when contacted just tried to say this wasn't happening and it was a small matter, but it totally isn't. And anybody that's been going to Hope knows this. There's a private detective that gives talks at Hope every time. His talks are fantastic, and he shows you how he can find out everything about everything. The private detectives know they subscribe to these services, and they get credit card numbers, social security numbers, your history, your financial profile, just everything. That's what it's easily available to anybody in the business, not only detectives, but anybody in advertising. They all get complete demographic data to target ads. It's been around for a really long time. Um, as a new zero day, but he didn't dump the proof of concept, just a video. He can jump the, he can steal everybody's passwords out of the keychain without 
administrator privileges on a Mac, and even you steal other people's passwords out of the keychain on your Mac without administrator privileges, which sounds pretty good. And he dumped it publicly, and he did not even tell Apple how it works because he's protesting the fact that Apple has no bounty program for Mac OS. They have for the iPhone, but not Mac OS. So, uh, we'll, yeah. One. Yeah. So that location data is just based on cellular phone towers, not whether. No, that's the new thing. It's not just the cell phone tower, but the GPS data also. Oh, so it is like reporting from the iPhone. Yeah. yeah, so they can locate you to like which room in the building. Okay. Yeah. yeah it's, the phone companies always have like, like depending on which tower you're talking to. Yeah, they, that's the stuff that cops can get without a warrant and everything. That's pretty easily obtainable by almost anybody. Which tower you're in, that just gets you to the nearest hundred yards. They're getting the whole shebang there, and they're, that is shocking enough that they're still in the mode of trying to pretend you're lying. It's not true. Even if you turn like location services off. Well, I don't know about that. I turning location services off ought to stop it. Although I have seen some claims that it doesn't really. Um, but certainly, you would think that turning off location services would do it. Um, I would think of normal circumstances it would. This one is the kind of thing we've heard for years, I'm amazed. What this woman did was send text messages to her boyfriend while he was killing himself, encouraging him to kill himself, and he killed himself. And this has never been a prosecutable offense. There was a famous case eight years ago of a woman who, a mother of a teenage child who didn't like her teenage child's girlfriend or something, and impersonated another teenager online to make a relationship to break it up to get them to kill themselves, which worked. And I don't think they were able to do anything to her because if you just talk in America, it's very hard to prosecute you for that. It's very hard to blame you for the fact that somebody else kills themselves. Anyway, um, this is she's going to currently getting a term in prison for sending text messages encouraging someone else to commit suicide. So it is... Um, this is the modern way, and now we're going to be censoring the political speech on the internet. There's a, we are we're move, back, really backing away from this old-fashioned idea of free speech. We're moving towards China, where there's whole categories of stuff you're not allowed to say, and whole censorship of this and that. And so the rules are changing, and people are uh, are not sure what they dare do anymore. So anyway, um, uh, so there, here's here's an example. This guy found this, these guys found a vulnerability. They contacted the vendor. The vendor said, thanks a lot, said we're going to fix it, promised them a bounty, promised them a patch, never sent the money, never patched the product, and finally attacked them physically when they went to a security convention to give a talk about it. Um, this is somewhat extreme, but this is usually what you get from companies. Companies just tell you lies and lies when you talk to them. They just don't want to hear it. It's expensive to fix. Even if you get one person that agrees, the other people don't agree. You know, it's... Yeah. Researcher. Yeah, and he even got part of it on video, yeah. They're, 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 these guys are a little more psycho than most. I've had them like this. Um, there's, there's a lot of people that are, you know, they manufacture their product, they're selling it, and they wish you would just shut up. This was Microsoft's official position in the early days. They said if all these hackers would just shut up and not tell anybody, everything would be fine. And that is a very popular belief. And, of course, see, the thing is, you know, when I find a vulnerability, if I was so smart that I was the only guy on Earth that could find it, that might be true, but I'm not. I'm really not. If I found it, a whole bunch of other people already know it. <laughs> but um, anyway, there's a lot of misunderstanding about this stuff. This one's pretty fun. Zcash is a privacy coin. That's one of the reasons it exists. And as you might imagine, privacy coins have a problem because you can't track them back to the origin at all. And it turns out that there was an error in their hash function, so you could print forge money up to an infinite amount. They would never know it was fake. And they found it by doing a mathematical analysis of the protocol before it was exploited, which is rare. They find Anyway, so it's pretty cute. I tried to get a clear idea of exactly what it is, and it is pretty esoteric. I was thinking we'd do it in my cryptography class if I could understand it, but it's not easily understood. Um, and uh, there's a problem with RDP. Um, what these guys did, this has been, uh, I've heard this happen a few times. I remember when um, Heartbleed came out, <coughs> Heartbleed <coughs> would let you steal secrets from a server, but the other form of Heartbleed, which was entertaining, is you could make a malicious server that stole things from your client when you connected. And I set that one up. I set up a malicious server, you connected to HTTPS, it would steal the RAM from your machine. That was pretty awesome. And these guys did the same thing with Microsoft Remote Desktop Protocol. People have been worried about RDP vulnerabilities for decades, where someone comes in and takes over your machine that is offering remote desktop protocol service. But these guys did the other. They made a malicious RDP server so that when you connect, it steals data from you. 
And that turns out to be pretty easy because people weren't thinking of that direction of attack and they found that most RDP clients are in fact vulnerable this way. So um, this is quite common. If you think of anything that's a little bit twisted and backward, then probably whoever designed the products didn't think of it and there's just obvious holes just waiting in there. Anyway, um, all right. So we're on to the official time here, so here we are. Uh, now I'm changing the projects a bit, which some of you may have noticed, because I have some students that are trying to do this class on Windows. Now I've been saying just forget it, don't even try to do it on Windows, but I'm planning to teach this in China and at DEF CON and everywhere, and I'm trying again, can it be done in Windows? And I think maybe it's possible to do it on Windows. So I'm writing a Windows track of projects. Um, it turns out there are more emulators on Windows. And they are better than they were the last time I looked at them, or at least maybe I didn't find the right ones before. But BlueStacks is pretty good. So you can do some of these projects with the BlueStacks emulator. You cannot um, get burp in the middle on BlueStacks. And now all these emulators are, you know, VirtualBox is open source. So all these emulators take VirtualBox and then they modify it and put a brand name on it and sell it. But it's not exactly equal to VirtualBox anymore. So you can't really adjust the parameters in VirtualBox. And you have whatever limited portion of virtual back settings they give you. But anyway, so I found I was able to use the BlueStacks emulator for some things, and I was able to use the Knox emulator for other things on Windows. And you can actually do most of these projects on Windows. So I've written up a Windows track here, and I'm going to have two tracks. So people can do the whole class in Windows or Linux as far as I can go. Um, I got these two ready. They're just not posted yet, and I'll keep going. One thing that is strange is you cannot do the Ask a Lawyer app on Windows. It won't run in the Windows emulator, and I can't figure out why, but another app from the same company with the same flaw runs over here. So I was looking through my records. I, keep, I, I tested hundreds of apps and kept notes, and I said, well, who else made this mistake? And it turned out that most of the really big companies with more than a million installs that I told like three, four years ago about plain text network transmissions have actually fixed it. I mean, that is so awful that they only ignore you for about two years. Um, so... But, but these guys didn't. The guys that made Ask a Lawyer and Clear Messenger, their stuff has been garbage. And what's funny is Clear Messenger is entertaining because they market this as a secure messenger product. And it is complete shit. It is um, their secure messenger, and it sends your login in plain text and all the past chat in plain text, and it just is ridiculous. I think it stores your password locally in plain text. and stuff is just complete crap. And, uh, you know, as anybody would tell you, I, I, read a, I read a tweet a few years ago from a guy who had a daughter who was like three years old, and you heard her talking to her friend saying, oh, we'll get the toy, but the toy's never as good as they make it look on the package. He said, I'm a proud dad. They learn, you know, everybody knows when they tell you it's secure, that probably means it's crap. Yeah. In the host windows. I downloaded Jenny Motion on Windows 7 using Wireshark on, with Jenny Motion on Windows. Okay, that's good if you can do it. Some people were able to do it, some people weren't. But anyway, I'm writing other versions, so that's good. Um, Burp is a pain. I just got it working now with a different emulator. The problem with Burp is you have to mess with the networking, and all these emulators don't really give you access to the network settings. And uh, it uh, was not easy. Anyway, so um, I'm trying to make it so the Windows users we can do it as easily as the Mac users. And uh, it might be possible this semester, but Windows users uh, do have some suffering. Anyway, we are going to go through the second bit. I decided to break this chapter into three pieces because there's so much information in this Android chapter, which is I think, the main point of the course anyway. And so uh, 6B and 6C, there's three lectures and three quizzes on this chapter, which I think is the way to go because there's lots of good information here. So this is 6B. All right. And there are going to be cahoots. Let me bring those up. All right. And there it is. Okay. So let's talk about Android and uh, how the apps work. So we talked a little bit about it here, setting up an app. And now we're going to talk about the Android security model. And that's this whole class and part of the next one. And that's, of course, the part that's most interesting to us. The Android security model is very strange. I'm glad to learn a little more about it. I used to think these guys were just idiots, and it's a little more complicated than that. They're not simply just idiots, but it is a very strange model, and um, certainly a lot of strange effects. So let's talk about then some things. Are, we're going to do code signing, permissions, the sandbox, and encryption. So 
Here's the security model. In the first place, the huge thing that's, that's a huge problem about the security model is anybody can put an app on from anywhere. That's their fundamental open source philosophy. You can write your own apps, you can give them to your friends, you don't need to get approval from Google or anything, which is the main reason why it's so fantastically dangerous compared to Apple. Apple has their store and you have to go to their store and you have to meet their tests and they're actually pretty strict about their tests and they really kick you out if you do anything bad and they know who you really are so you can never get back in again. So you can never make any money selling more iOS apps if you put junk in the store and that scares people so much that they really don't do it. And, and, I, and Charlie Miller, the uh, ex-NSA iOS expert, really wrote a malicious app and put it in the iPhone store to see what they would do, and they really booted him forever. And he said, I'm a real researcher. This was your test purpose. And they said, we don't care. Be gone. <laughs> We're not kidding. And that scares them in line. Android has nothing like that. If you put poison in the Android store, they usually won't even notice it. After many millions of people have been infected, they'll hit the headlines, they'll notice it. Then they'll kick it out and ban your account. You just make another free email account with a different fake name and go right back in and put in another pile of apps. And that's what people do. That's open source, right? You don't know who people are. They're not paying anything. You can't control them at all. So that's the big design decision that limits you. But anyway, they do have a plan for sandboxing. And this is because Android is more mature than iPhone in this regard. When iPhone first came out, the first iPhone, every process ran as root. It was a very simple, like Kali Linux. You just log in as root, everything's root. There was no app store, there were no apps. It just had the code that Apple put on the phone, like other phones, and therefore they didn't figure there was any issue. But when they had the app store and they started to put apps on, then you had to face the issue that you probably just don't want everything running as root. So Android wanted to have a sandbox. And the goal of the sandbox is to make sure that one app cannot access the memory being used by another app and it cannot access the storage used by another app. Now, there are many ways to do that. And when they say they put a sandbox in, what most people think that means is that each process runs in its own virtual machine which is what I thought when I first had this explained to me, each run on their own Android virtual machine. That is not true, because my first thought, of course, is also true, you can't possibly have enough resources to do that. There is, a, there is an operating system that does that called Cube, it's from Joanna Brotskowska, the, the world's expert on rootkits. And it runs like five virtual machines on yours, one for banking, one for social networking, you stop them from stealing each other's data, and it's regarded as very secure, but it is very much a resource hog, obviously. You try running four or five virtual machines on your machine, they're all gonna be pretty slow. That's a really expensive form of security. It's pretty secure, but your phone can't be doing that, and it's totally not doing that. What it's doing is running each of them as their own user account, and the user accounts don't have permissions to access each other. So the only barrier, which they call a sandbox, is the kernel permissions that user 102 is not allowed to access user 302, 103's files, that's all, which is the same separation between users on a desktop operating system. So that's a thing, that's what they call a sandbox. So the next issue is code signing. You, you might wanna have a suite of apps that all come from the same developer that can share data, like Microsoft Office. You've got Excel and Word and PowerPoint, and they can all see each other's files, and they're supposed to be able to see each other's files. So it's not okay to have them isolated from each other. So to penetrate the sandbox, you have to know who made the app. And if I wanna update the app, and maybe even auto update the app or something, then I need to know if the update came from the same developer. So you have to have some way of knowing who people are, and that's the purpose of these digital certificates. They're signed with the same kind of digital certificates you use on the web that Google uses, but they are self-signed typically. They're not verified by any certificate authorities. So you can, the certificates do not prove anything. The only thing they do is prove that if you get another app from the same person with the same signature, it's the same as the other one, because they can't be forged. But you can take them off and put a different signature on the app and they'll still regard it as equally valid. But you cannot, I can't make a fake update for an Android app that's signed, unless I can steal their private key and duplicate that signature. If I make a fake app for say the Bank of America, like you're gonna do, then you would have to trick the customer into removing the real Bank of America app and then putting on your fake one. It wouldn't go on as an update because Google would notice, the Android system would notice that. So anyway, you wanna make your own, you use key tool to make the key, it's just an easy process, then you sign it with jar signer, that puts your signature on it. These are what's called snake oil certificates, they call them the years. These are certificates that are signed by you. So they really don't prove anything, <laughs> except that uh, they prove if you sign a second thing, you're still the same person, that's about it. Um, 
They're sort of like the ID card you used to get at a bar where you can just slip somebody a hundred bucks and I'll make a duplicate ID card. It looks about as good. So it doesn't really prove that you are that person. So APK, APK tools, the tool we're going to use here, it's a great one for this. You can just take apart an app with APK tool D and then the APK file, which comes from Google play or from a phone. It'll just unpack it. Now, if you use a minus R command, which you do in most of the projects, it doesn't bother to unpack the resources. That turns out to be very handy because if you do unpack the resources, many apps will not let you rebuild the app because it's unable to rebuild the resources. So by not unpacking them and just putting them back in intact, it's easier to decode an app, mess with it, and recode it. But if you want to see everything in the app, then you don't put in that switch and unpack the whole thing. And if it's an app that is fairly friendly, you can unpack it all and even repack it. So you'll find a meta int folder in an original subfolder, and in here is the certificate, cert.rsa. And then there are other things here. The cert.rsa is a binary file, but you can open it with various tools. And here I opened it with KeyTool. KeyTool will let you print the contents. And here you see the same kind of information you'd see if you looked at a certificate in a browser. The name of the company, Bank of America and so on, certificate fingerprints, SHA-1 and SHA-256, signed with MD5 with RSA, which is actually pretty appalling. MD5 is terrible for this purpose, um, but that's what Bank of America is using. Now, um, Here's the certificate public key, 1,024 bits. Now, if you've been paying attention in your security classes, you might notice this is actually pretty awful. 1,024 bits has been abandoned and deprecated for about three years. MD5 has been deprecated for about 15 years. What's going on here? And I don't know exactly what's going on here, but I do know one thing, which my first, I did in fact put this on Twitter. I said, hey, Bank of America, what do you think you're doing? Of course, they won't tell me anything like they never tell you anything. But I said, this is pretty appalling that you're signing stuff with things that have been known to be broken for a decade. But um, there are two ameliorating factors. Um, one is that even though you can make an MD5 hash collision, you cannot actually make a certificate collision. That has never been done. It turns out to be more difficult. Um, so this is not as bad as you might think. Another factor is this. What the official Android rules say, if you put an app and you sign it, you should make the signature, your certificate good for 25 years. And if you put it in the Google Play Store, it has to be good until like 2033. The reason is because you might want to update your app. Therefore, there is no choice, but a lot of those certificates are really old. You can't change them. If you change them, then all the existing apps can't be updated. So there's kind of a chicken and the egg problem here. You're going to be using certificates that are from two, one or two decades in the past as time goes on, and it just seems to be endemic to the model. It's another strange thing about the security model that you could get mad about, but that's the way it is. Um, anyway, so you can view the uh, certificate here, and here's the uh, from 2008 at DEF CON. They sent the paper. This was when um, the certificate authority, DigiCert, or I think RSA, I, I think a big one, um, um, was actually selling certificates signed with MD5. And these guys managed to make two, a fake certificate to impersonate the certificate authority with MD5. But what they did was they weren't able to take a real certificate where nobody had the private key. They were able to make two certificates to make them collide. I mean, they were able to make a defect that showed that this is not perfect, but they were not really able to duplicate somebody else's key, which is what I thought they could do. So that's what I'm saying. Even an MD5 collision doesn't mean you can have... You can make an MD5 collision. You can maliciously create two files that have the same MD5, but you cannot take an arbitrary file from somebody else and make another one with the same MD5. That is a more difficult task. These are different levels of pre-image resistance, and we'll play with them a bit more in the cryptography class. But anyway, this is a, this is a big issue. There are many ways for cryptography to be broken, and there's some point when it's totally broken and totally useless, but most of the stuff we use is a little broken but still has some value. Um, and MD5 signatures are not completely useless yet. It's just that since it would be so easy to just use something better like SHA-256, there's no good reason to keep using them for new products. But there are perfectly valid reasons to keep using old signatures for old products rather than um, updating them if it's going to break backward compatibility. And that's what this, Nick, this is a Cloudflare link from 2015 explaining this. Why just the fact that we had a SHA-1 collision that year from Google does not mean that all the certificates signed with SHA-1 keys are broken and useless. They just are weaker, but they're not yet broken to where you can easily forge them. Anyway, so certificate validation, Android just doesn't. 
So a certificate is just believed, doesn't have to come from an authority, it can be self-signed. It, you know, it doesn't check it except once when you install the app. When you install the app, it takes like a, a, a hash of the app and make sure that it matches the signed hash and the signature. So the app has not been modified, that, and that's it. It never checks it again. So if you, uh, that's a thing to do. But of course, the purpose of that is that means nobody can add Trojan code to the app after it's signed. So if you trust the signature and it's coming from a company you trust, then, uh, then you might believe that nobody had a chance to modify it. We're totally going to modify apps and add Trojan code in here, but, but they have a different signature. So it would be easily detected if anybody cared. Um, what's amazing is these huge companies do not bother to check. They could very easily check and see if this app is in fact signed by me anymore. And if somebody tries to connect to my bank and they're using an app that is no longer signed by me, I can say no. The NFL does that. The, uh, the government of India does that, but the Bank of America doesn't for no apparent reason. Just like they don't obfuscate their code, they just violate the basic security features and everybody in the world does because they, nobody seems to care. And they will eventually care when we humiliate them enough. And we're all part of that process. So that's your validity period. Um, so there are some vulnerabilities here. There were quite a few errors in the certificate signing process in Android that led to um, big problems, and these you will see over and over again. They're also, we'll do them in the uh, web ha hacking class. There was a whole series of vulnerabilities in SAML. If you use the tool we use for quizzes, Canvas, if you watch, it has a SAML request. You can see it in the URL bar going up to the server. That is a way of security assertion markup language where you pass information about your privileges up to the server, like I'm logged in as this person and I'm not the administrator. And there were a series of similar vulnerabilities in SAML where you could just add extra statements to a SAML assertion, like I have a SAML assertion that says I'm Sam. Then I'll just add something then that says I'm the administrator, and it doesn't actually verify all of it with the signature, so the new assertion is believed also. This sounds stupid, but it's pretty easy to do because they're writing modular code, so they have a module that checks the signature. Then later, they have a, so they check the signature, they compare it to the part of the data it's supposed to sign, it matches, they check that off, then they pass it to a different module, which takes all the assertions and implements them. That module doesn't know it was only supposed to have one assertion. This module says it passed. It's very much the problem on the web. You have servers, each of which do one job. It's like a bunch of stupid people in a factory. This person says, you know, I remember I, there was a married couple who was newly married, went to their house one time. One of them was like washing dishes, the other one was drying dishes, and then they would put it in the dishwasher or something. It was like, wash it on, put it back in the sink, you know. Each person does their job, and they're unaware of the fact that the end result is nonsense. So this kind of thing tends to happen. Anyway, the master key vulnerability was found by Blue Box, and this was very similar. You can have two files in a zip archive with the same name. It is possible. And if you do, the signing algorithm only sees the first one. But when they're, in, when they're put on the phone, the second one is the one that ends up on the phone. This is very much like what happened with SAML. So you can put one here that matches the signature and put another one here that won't be tested that will override it. And then you end up on the phone with the poison without failing the signature test. There was a similar one I saw at the hacking conventions a few years back where they take Microsoft signed code and put malware in it because Microsoft code signatures, there's like seven sections to the file and it doesn't really check them all. So you can add poison to the other sections that are not included in the signature. So it's, um, you know, all these techniques, when I first heard about code signing, I said, boy, that sounds great. That'll really stop everything. But when you, there's always this case, you have a brilliant idea that sounds good, but when you actually build something using it, you have to make approximations and, and you don't really end up with the beautiful security you thought you were going to end up with. Yeah. So wasn't that a patch? Like yes. They, oh, these, well, these have all been patched. These are public and known. So modern versions of Android, uh, I don't think have these yet anymore. I haven't tested them, but yeah, that's the point. They came out. So here's another one that came out just three days later. Um, the length field is a 16-bit value. Now it goes to Java. This is one that comes over and over and over again. It's variable types. So many problems from variable types. You have a 16-bit value that can go from 0 to 65, 536. But Java did not interpret it as that kind of integer. It interpreted it as a signed integer. So we go to plus 32,768 and minus 32,767 or something. So all you have to do is put in a name that is long enough, and it will now be treated as a negative number. So it will not pass, will not be bounced by your length name check. And this is how a lot of buffer overflows happen. An integer overflow, they call this, where a number rolls over and becomes negative. So your is this number bigger than some value? 
doesn't work when it should have stopped you from passing a large value in. So they were now able to, again, the same thing, they can eject files that don't get checked for signatures. And this was a similar one. The name field length was not checked. So you could inject code in the file name and you pass the signature validation with the code in there. Um, this, there was another one when the Chrome browser first came out. There was a, all you had to do was save a page in Chrome browser and give it a name longer than 128 characters and get the blue screen of death. You know, it's just buffer overflows are very simple, but they never go away. Or you only have so much room and there's some way to put in too much stuff. They're very easy to exploit in many cases. So, all right, then there's these permissions. Permissions are another layer of security in Android. You have the sandboxing, which is done by just user accounts on the machine. And then you have these permissions. This app wants to access your contacts and your camera and your Wi-Fi that pop up on the screen. So these are what you might think of as sort of horizontal permissions instead of vertical permissions. Um, anyway, they're defined in the manifest. If you just look at the manifest here, it has these things called Android permission, wake clock, read phone state, access network state, and like NTFS permissions in the world of Microsoft, the actual permissions on the phone are a very long list of these little elemental things. And these things you show to the user are actually synthetic approximations. So when it says access the camera, that's really a bunch of little things. It doesn't list you all the little atomic permissions because that wouldn't mean anything to you. It bundles them up into meaningful groups for the user to answer. Now, um, when Android, until maybe four years ago, I heard a lot of people complain, you don't have any choice here except accept or give up on the app. And they said, this is annoying. So you can put on third-party products that will actually give you a lineup and veto here. You can say, you can do this, you can't do that, you can do this, you can't do that. And you could totally do that. And then the app would lose part of its functionality, but you might get the other part. And that is an option for security-conscious users. Most users just don't care. They don't even look at this, just accept, sure. But you know, it is an issue. Uh, and I've heard of another class of vulnerabilities, not mentioned in your book. I've heard quite a few examples at the conference where you can get permissions that the user did not approve. The implementation of these permissions was clumsy and you could trick it into giving you permissions that the user hadn't really uh, approved. As you would imagine, every step in the whole thing has its bugs. Anyway, so those are your protection levels. Um, you can, now you can define a new permission. This, I think, started with Skype. Skype, at least I heard about it because of Skype. Skype created a new intent, a new um, type of data. You know, there's a protocol in front of a URL, like HTTP or HTTPS, then there's mail too. There's a bunch of them. So Skype invented one called Skype. You can have Skype colon slash slash, and then a phone number and it would call. So they created a new protocol. Now, of course, the new protocol wasn't understood by any other applications that would have security boundaries. So it turned out that anybody else could just send a Skype colon slash slash URL, like in an SMS, you click it, it'll make a phone call. Any place, you can put it anywhere in a web page, just anywhere. It turned out you could send Skype calls without the user even knowing by just putting this combination of characters somewhere on something that came in. So they had to add a special security feature that would always pop up a box asking before it dials the phone because it turns out when you, but anyway, um, these things are called new permissions. You can define this new thing to make a Skype call. I'm gonna define a Skype permission. I'm gonna make a broadcast receiver that will accept uh, requests from any other app. So if any of you have a Skype URL, you just pass it over here and I'll handle it for you. So if you're gonna do that, then you define it down here and you can now specify who's allowed to use your newly defined permission. So different ways to do it. And you can sort them in categories. Normal is the normal value. Um, dangerous is for higher dangerous permissions that are considered to really hurt you. Signature means only apps from the same company with the same signature can use it. Nobody, I will not accept any requests from anybody else. Signature or system means, as you would imagine, apps from the same company can use it and Android system apps that came from Google can use it. Um, or things that signed in the system folder, which I'm not sure who can do that except Google. Maybe some people can. I suppose if you root your phone, of course, all bets are off. You can put things in the system folder and they didn't be in that category. So system uh, development is one not even uh, covered very much in any of the documentation. There is some option called development for categories of permissions. It's not very clear what it does. There's a few sort of blog entries about it. Google, this is another thing very much true of Windows and also true of Android. There's a bunch of stuff that is not documented. There's a bunch of sort of lore that the experts know about these funny features you can turn on. If you do the malware analysis class, which we may have next semester and we may not, God only knows, then um, we do a lot of this. There's a bunch of stuff malware uses that's in Microsoft, but they don't want you using it so they don't tell you about it, but people figure it out. Um, 
So signature protection is what they recommend. If you define some new function on the phone that has to do with your app, you should only let other people from your company use it. Don't let the whole world use it unless you really think you need that because you're just asking for abuse. So you don't, when all else fails, just give it signature permission and then nobody else will be using it. That's the idea. So now you can have malicious apps. This is the main way you hack Android phones. There are various other flaws in the operating system, but obviously, as everyone knows, I was thrilled when I got my first Android phone, the very first one. I went to the store like the first week. I sold the very first app that was a ringtone, and it was all full of like spam wallpaper. I said, man, it's malware right there on the phone. This is awesome. And, and um, there are a bunch of apps that are just malware. They just do awful things. So you just trick people into installing malware apps on the phone. Now you've got access to the phone pretty much. Now the sandboxing should stop you, but... That's the next barrier. That's a pretty small barrier. So on you go. So once you do, get on the phone. Now, um, if you can trick them into putting the app on the phone, then you have to gain root to get access to the other app's data. If you want to put it on the phone with no user interaction, that would be awesome. And that's hard. Now, there have been examples that do this with like Gingerbreak. Uh, that is what, um, there was one of these that came out just last week, an expose of an espionage tool used by nation states to spy on dissidents. They had this technique they could use for two years that would put malware on iPhones with no user interaction. And they still haven't explained exactly how it works, but they said this is open season. Send us a list of all the people who want to spy on thousands at a time. We'll put it in this tool. It just puts malware on their phone. We can hear all their phone calls and SMSs. And they've been doing this to everybody. So, you know, that's, it's a thing to know. It's not like that can't be done. It's just that that is so difficult and valuable that only the nation states have it. Your average criminals don't have that power. They will have to do something like send you an email saying, please send your money to Nigeria and hope you're dumb enough to do it, rather than being able to just put malware on your phone and take your SMS messages and your password right off of it. Anyway, so the application sandbox is here. Um, if you look at uh, Coinbase, for example, on my phone, I have Coinbase and Schwab, so I can do egrep to do a... A search for WAB or Coinbase, and I can look in the data data folder because the data data folder is the home for all the apps. Every app has its own folder here, and so Coinbase has its folder there, and Schwab has its phone there. The apps, and so they each have their own user account, and they're just numbered in the order in which they were installed. So I apparently installed Schwab first and Coinbase later, so this is user 129, and this is user 145, and the permissions, this Coinbase app Let's read, write, execute for the owner, but nobody else. So nobody can get at the Coinbase data except the Coinbase app. Schwab, for some reason, makes it readable by anyone in the group and executable by everyone. So they must be offering something they want the whole public to get to. I don't know what it is. I haven't analyzed the app that deeply. You totally could. It's very easy to analyze these apps. You can see the source code. You can grep for things. You can see the names of the methods. It's not very difficult at all if you see something funny like this to dig down to the bottom of it, just a few hours of work, and you could understand why they're doing that. I haven't done that, but it might be fun. Um, anyway, so uh, that's the game. Uh, so these are the limitations. You do not have a separate machine for each app, just Linux user and groups permissions. So if you have a kernel exploit and you can elevate to root, you can just sail right past that. And every version of Android, and for that matter, Windows, has an endless chain of local privilege escalation exploits. They seem to come out about every three months. So anything that has not been updated in the last month or two, there is probably just a known thing you can download that will elevate you from a limited user to root on any platform. It is not that difficult. It's a routine activity in post-exploitation. Um, so that should make you nervous. Then there's file system encryption. Now, this is something that is kind of useless on a server, but it is a good idea on a phone, obviously, a phone or a laptop. Something that is good, the only thing file system encryption does is protect you in case someone steals the whole device. Well, it's turned off, and then they want to take the data off the hard drive. If it was encrypted, it would, they wouldn't be able to get it because there's a special encryption key needed to boot it up, and it's not anywhere on the device. That's the idea. Or if it is on the device, it's stored in a secure element, which is a special chip that is intended to make it almost impossible to steal. So this has been available in Android for a really long time, but almost never turned on because it slows down the thing and drains the battery. And Androids have an enormous problem with battery life. One of the first things I noticed about my Android is it's dead all the time. I have to charge it every day. I've charged it twice a day. If you get an iPhone, it's good for like three days. I say, man, what's the difference? And the difference is Apple writes the apps and they require that you don't waste power. 
They have rules. Android, I went to the Android Developers <laughs> I.O. Conference, and they had a whole track on not wasting power. I went to the talks. They had all these complicated things they wanted you to do to not waste power, and no way to make you do them, so the developers just don't bother. Why should they? <laughs> they just write their app sloppily, and they don't bother to do the 50 complicated things that Google says you should do, and your battery goes down, so it's really annoying. I, that's why I had to throw away my first Android phone and get an iPhone. I wore out the connector charging it because it has this lousy little wedge-shaped USB thing that bends up when you plug it in. It doesn't even a good bayonet like the iPhone, and you have to use it so much that you wear it out before a while. Anyway, so it's not enabled. Now, the encryption is mathematically fine. AES CVC, which is perfectly fine. That's even AES 256, I think. It's a perfectly fine, strong algorithm. Um, but it's usually not turned on. So what good is that? FTE, so-called full disk encryption, is in fact going away and replaced by file disk encryption, and I don't know much about it. There's a new uh, link here. But here's the real problem with Android. This is the main reason. Well, there are a lot of good reasons why Android is a mess, but this is probably the main one. This is the reason why Android is popular, and it's the reason why it's incredibly insecure. There is no effective update process. These are the Android versions. So here we are, this is uh, 2018, I think, and this, this is the newest version. Typically, the newest version of Android is less than 1% when it first comes out being used, and after years later, it's only like 30 or 40%. So the latest version of Android was under 30% here. Most phones are like three or four years old, and they don't get any updates, not even security updates. Even if Google produces the updates, the carriers routinely block them, because the updates give you new features and the carriers are charging you money for their imitation of those features. So they have a financial incentive to block the updates. Google has been talking for years about catching up with Microsoft from two decades ago and having a security update channel that is different than the feature update channel. So the carriers can allow security updates through without letting the feature updates through. And as far as I know, that has still not happened. So it's just amazing. People don't patch their phones. And as you know, anything you don't patch, there's like you have all these news articles I tell you, there's a flood of zero days coming out all the time. If you haven't patched your stuff, that is, you're just wide open. And most phones, Android phones are wide open. Anyway, so um, the SD card is never encrypted. You, yeah. I'm sorry, I have a question about that. Doesn't Android, however, uh, force you to uh, update your phone? No, not even iPhone does that. I mean, mine pops up a box saying you there is an update available, but you can say no. Ah, it has automatic updates now. Yeah, it, it, you can say remind me later. Yeah. Well, that's that's probably a lot better because of this. Most of them don't have that, and. Um, of course, if you're going to, that's what Microsoft finally did with Windows 10. They force you to take the updates, and then the updates are all broken and mess you up. That's a problem. The, I haven't heard so many people screaming and yelling about Android updates, though. They sure yell about app, Mac updates and Windows updates, but that's usually the problem. When you force them to take the updates, then you want to make sure the updates are not bad. And that's one thing on Android I have not heard. I have not been, I've heard a lot of whining about bad updates. So maybe they got that part right. I think... I'm, I, people say I'm very cynical, but uh, in my opinion, if you're, uh, the real reason I imagine I don't hear the complaints is because nobody's bothering to update their stuff. But anyway, um, so uh, I don't see a chat message coming in. Anyway, let's see. Uh, my cheaper Moto has periodic updates. Okay, well that's good. Well, maybe it's gonna. Um, maybe this is being addressed in newer phones, and that's that's will eventually get there when the old phones get so obsolete they fall out of use. Anyway, so the this encryption does not apply to the SD card. And of course, most people misunderstand encryption. I've read articles all over the web saying you have to encrypt it so people don't steal your stuff in case they like put a malicious app on your device. Well, it's not going to do anything in case they put a malicious app on your device because that's when the phone is turned on. Once you turn it on and log in, it's not encrypted anymore because you're running with a private process that has the privilege of decrypting it. The only thing decryption protects you from is if the phone is stolen while it's turned off. Well, it's not logged in anyway. So it's um, encryption is not at all protecting you from things that will happen while you're actually using the phone, which is the main way you attack people. Anyway, so uh, that's as much of that. Looks like went through it a little faster than I expected, but that'll do. And there are some cahoots. You guys are beginning to ask for money, which is interesting. 
If it could go down, my class will be less fun. Anyway, um, that's 6B, and here it is. Okay. I have already written my alternative to Cahoots, but I don't have the fun music and stuff, so. Permission managers? You know, the ones that let you choose that? I'm not sure. I've heard a few of them. I don't know how many. That's a good question. Uh, reviews give you some idea. Yeah. <laughs> Nancy Pelosi, there you go. <laughs> Apparently she's not running for president. Good. She's very stern and firm, firm about that, so it's going to be Kamala Harris, I guess. Or Biden. <laughs> Kamala Harris is saying a lot of good things lately. I know I know some friends that, that hate both of them because of what they did here a while ago, but I don't know if that's entirely legitimate, but they... If you know the San Francisco dirt, the politics around here is really dirty. <laughs> it's sort of like Chicago. You don't go up in the political machine here without getting pretty dirty. <laughs> I can't say with authority. They're both pretty dirty. <laughs> New York City is too, of course. And I think any big city, the politics gets really corrupt. So this is CNET 128, Chapter 6B, Cahoots. And it is 26. All right. There we are. I'll give it a few more seconds. Oh, they're still coming in. All right, I'll wait maybe 10 more seconds then. All right. So what do you get from an app signature? None of them, but this is, by the way, if you get a Windows code signing signature, you get all of these. If you get an HTTPS signature on the web, you get two of these, but you get none of them from Android. It is a very strange system. So what's the vulnerability to use two files at the same file? Name? Okay, that was master key, so-called. All right, what file lists the permissions an app requires? It's in the manifest. Now, if you want it to be pedantic, you could say it's in the base because everything is in the base, but whenever there's like a general answer and a more specific answer, the more specific answer is correct. This works on real cert tests too. But anyway, these are just certificates. They don't contain any data, but Android manifest lists the permissions, also the intents and such. All right. What permission level should you use if you define a new permission? Okay, signatures which are recommended. That means, of course, nobody can use it but you, and that would that ought to be the default, unless you really believe you need to broadcast some service to the whole world. All right, and how many phones are encrypted in the real world? I forgot to mention this, but it was on the slides.
Yep, it was the estimate from a company in I think 2017 was that it was like 12% of the phones are encrypted, which they did by taking the versions and erasing it on that. But anyway, all right, so we got um, Forrest is a real name and these other two, I'm not gonna know. Uh, WITB I think is a serial person that does not care about getting points. And uh, Johnny Chingus, I do. Okay, well, want to tell me your name? Ed. Okay, right, Ed, okay. Uh, how the last initial? B? F. Okay, that'll do. Good, yeah, much better, all right, good. So, um, let me save that, and let's just see if there's something I, so the projects I mentioned, you can really move ahead in Android, I mean, on Windows. Aha, a chat message is coming in, perhaps. Hey Sam, are these servers for Android apps usually Linux? Or is it common to see Windows servers? Um, I don't have, oh, WITB finally told me his name. Holy cow. Neat. I mean, okay, good. I'll make a note. I thought we had a record somewhere of your name, but I couldn't find it. Okay. So anyway, um, all right. So are the servers for Android apps usually Linux-based or are they Windows? That is an interesting question. I do not really know, but I'll say this. The, ser the um, There are two different kinds of servers. There are servers that deliver the apps. If you don't put them in Google Play, you can put them on anything, like an FTP server or anything. And then there's the servers that take the API calls for the data from the apps. And those can be in anything. Certainly a lot of those are Windows and a lot of those are Linux. So there are many servers involved. Um, so there's no simple answer. Uh, and you can see the API calls going by and you're often talking to like Java at the other end that could be running on a variety of systems. So there's not a simple answer. It's a good question, but I don't have a good simple answer for you. Anyway, um, all right. So I just want to see if there's anything I should tell you about these projects. Uh, there are two emulators. I put on BlueStacks, and it was really fast and nice. And then I found out that I could not get to the network to uh, make it go to ADB. I couldn't figure out. I could get to ADB, but I couldn't figure out how to put Burp in the middle because it even uh, it was giving me a lot of trouble. And so I switched to another one which I found in forums recommended, which is Knox. And Knox is very nice. Knox lets you adjust the local um, proxy the same way Jenny Motion does, which is very nice. You actually have the, for some reason, BlueStacks took away these network settings in the settings app, which is very rude. Now this one actually has the ability to bridge, which I thought was awesome, but I found out when you bridge it to an adapter, it locks up the adapter so you cannot bridge any other virtual motion machine, virtual box to the same adapter because it's using some mutant altered version of virtual box, which collects slides with real virtual box. And there is no way to connect it to real virtual box to use the virtual box utilities to control it the way you do with Jenny motion. So, that's the problem. That's the problem with open source. Once you make something open source, everybody will build it into their stuff and lock it in some old version and mutate it, and now you've got weird conflicts. So anyway, um, but however, you can actually, the one thing I wanted to mention, which I don't think I did before, is if you do make a blue stack simulator, it's not rooted. It's, now, I found that to be very useful because I was able to install the Bank of America and Staples and all these people that actually updated their app by a tiny bit to respond to all my humiliating and I wanted to humiliate them further and I couldn't get in the app. So I put it on this thing, which is not rooted, but you can root it. If you go down here, one of these projects like 6X is rooting it and that turns out to be extremely easy. This is also the case. One thing we don't have yet in this class is custom Android ROMs and I'm planning to add that next where you can just replace the system with a hacked system. Um, but a smaller modification than that is rooting it where you just get root privileges. Jenny Motion is already rooted but BlueStacks is not. So to root it, you just have to get a rooting tool. Same thing for most things. And it turns out that there's, you can get a root checker, which will just tell you if you have root permissions. And the point of this is the root permission model. We'll talk more about it next time. But if you, um, now you gotta talk about how do you wanna root something? Now there, you could do it in the insecure way, like Kali did, where you just run as root all the time. But that is pretty gruesome. You probably really don't wanna do that to your phone. So people want to have some ability to root it, to put on an unapproved app like a stolen game or something, but they don't want to root all the time. So what they typically do is they put in something like Super SU, which will have the ability to escalate you to root, but it does Microsoft's user account control. It'll pop a box saying, is it okay for this thing to escalate to root? And you have to give it permission. So you have some control over that, which is pretty much most, where most people think the sweet spot is. So this thing just tells you if you're root, and I'm not. So now to root it, you just download this router, BS Tweaker, to tweak BlueStacks. 
And all this thing does is give you a little GUI, and now you can stop it and patch it and root it just here in the GUI. This will now give you root privileges. It will install SuperSU, and then you update SuperSU. So SuperSU appears on a phone, which is super user command in Linux, and you have to update it. And then once you have updated it, it will now, um, when you try to get root privileges, it will say, somebody's trying to get root privileges, do you grant or deny? just like Microsoft would. So it's pretty cool. Now you can have a limited controlled amount of root available on your phone, which is what most people want. Then you can put on unapproved apps like hacking tools and stuff. And so we got that. The next thing is custom ROMs with special features. I've heard good things about them and we should be able to put those in some of these emulators. So that's what I'm hoping to have for you in the next couple of weeks here. Anyway, um, that's where we're going. So what if you are trying to do this class on PCs, these four projects are ready to go. These three have a special PC version. This one works the same on both. And I'm updating all the rest to make versions in all the columns. So you can do some of these. I know Kirk's been doing it all on PC. He does several of these. Some of them don't work. I'm still working on it. But I'm planning to have a whole PC track so that when I go to places like China, people can move ahead of they're using PC. And it's true of a lot of YouTube. People who only have a PC shouldn't be so left out as they have been. Um, I think it'll be possible for you to do everything you need to do on a PC. So. Will the proxy reroute every app on the device? Ha <laughs> ha, no, it will not emphatically. For example, most devices, Google Play will not reroute. Um, it is up to the Android system and not everything goes through. There are plenty of ways to get beyond it. If you wanna route every app on the device, what I would recommend is, I'm glad you remind me, it's a project I need to add. You put a physical man in the middle attack. You take a whole computer like a Mac, you connect the ethernet to the internet, you share the Wi-Fi and you connect to that Wi-Fi. Now your Mac is in the middle. Now you know that 100% of the traffic from that phone is going through that device. That's the way you really do make sure. You don't have some kind of software proxy. Uh, that is just a few commands on the Mac. You have to use the PF firewall. You can do it on Windows too, but I'm not quite sure how you do it on the latest Windows version, but it can be done. Um, it's a little bit annoying because it actually depends on which version of Mac you have. But anyway, I do have some of that written up and I'll get some version of it going. We can do it in the lab anyway. Um, that's the way to really do it. I mean, that is what the um, CERT did. CERT audited every app in the Google Play Store in 2014 to see if they broke SSL, and they did it with a custom router on the Wi-Fi network, so all the traffic went through their thing, and then their custom Wi-Fi router would try like five different kinds of bad certificates to give them to see if it would fall for any of them. And so it sounded pretty good, a lot more thorough than what you do with BERT. So I was really surprised when I repeated what they did and found a whole bunch of vulnerabilities they didn't find, and I found out what the problem is. It was totally automated. So it was the question of Tappy. You know, Tappy is the reason we're at war with Huawei in China. Or not, you know, because they stole Verizon or T-Mobile's Tappy tool to tap on the phone. What, the, what CERT did was they built something that would open up the app in an emulator, and then it would tap on some of the buttons to generate traffic. But it wasn't smart enough to actually log in or anything. So they didn't really test it very thoroughly. So if you manually test the app, you often find functionality that they missed, which I, I thought, you know, they're certain for the big shots, but they did a automated thing through, automated sweep through the whole app store. If you individually test them one by one, you find a lot more. And that is true of all penetration tests. You run something like a phone scanner, and then you have to do manual testing if you actually want to find out the more, because humans are far more precise and go into far more deep. IBM convention is coming up. Okay, I didn't know that. That might be something to check out. Okay, anything else? Well, then I'm going to shut down the share and, okay, good. And uh, I'll go upstairs and help anybody who wants to work here for a while. All right. Good. Oh, there are no chats coming in. Might see, have you tried Android x86? I think I have. I've tried things like that. And the ones I tried didn't work very well. Yeah, 